Good morning. I'm pleased to present this talk on tricuspid valve anatomy. Here are my disclosures. The objectives for my talk are first to review tricuspid valve anatomy. Then I will demonstrate how to identify trans, uh, the tricuspid valve leaflets using 2D and 3D transesophageal echocardiography. I will also touch upon how to identify the leaflets using transthoracic imaging, as sometimes the tricuspid valve leaflets are difficult to identify using transesophageal imaging, and a transthoracic probe may be needed. Finally, I discuss the incremental value of using 3D echocardiography to image the, tri the tricuspid valve. The tricuspid valve is the largest cardiac valve. It has an area between 7 to 9 centimeters squared. It's the most apically located of all the cardiac valves. It's composed of leaflets, chordae tendinae, papillary muscles, an annulus, as well as the RA and RV myocardium. The tricuspid valve leaflets can actually vary greatly in number. Normal subjects can have between two, three, or more leaflets. In the literature, there have been cases of pa patients with up to six leaflets. If you look at the top row of images, these are 3D transthoracic images of the tricuspid valve as viewed from the right ventricle. Uh, the septum is located at the 6 o'clock position, the anterior leaflet is generally at 3 o'clock, and the posterior leaflet around 9 o'clock. If you look at the top leftmost image, you can see that that patient has two leaflets. The middle, three leaflets, and the right the, uh, has four. If you look at the bottom row, these are pathologic specimens of tricuspid valve leaflets uh, or tricuspid valve uh, structures. If you look at the left, there are three leaflets identified, septal, posterior, and anterior. And then on the right, you can see that there are four leaflets identified. The tricuspid valve leaflets can actually vary in terms of size. The anterior leaflet tends to be the largest in terms of area as well as the longest. The posterior leaflet is the shortest circumferentially. It's made of multiple scallops and may not be clearly separated from the anterior leaflet in about 10% of patients. The septal leaflet tends to be the shortest radially. It's also the least mobile and inserts into the septum about 10 millimeters, apically to the septal insertion point of the anterior mitral valve leaflet. If you look at the um, transthoracic images on the top row, you can see the anterior, posterior, and septal leaflets as they're identified, as viewed from the right uh, ventricular perspective on the left, the right atrial perspective in the middle. And then there's a cross-sectional showing the septal insertion point of the tricuspid valve leaflet compared to the septal insertion point of the mitral valve leaflet. The tricuspid valve has two distinct papillary muscles. The anterior tends to be the largest. It supports both the anterior and posterior leaflets. There may be a moderator band that joins this papillary muscle. The posterior leaflet is often bifid or trifid, and it supports the posterior and septal leaflets. The septal papillary muscle is actually variable in, in most patients. It may be absent in up to 20% of normal individuals, or it may be present but then small and multiple. If you look at the top right image, you can see that's a transgastric view of the um, tricuspid valve. You can see the posterior leaflet is located there with um, uh, uh, that is bifid. And then you see the anterior um, papillary muscle, uh, which is single. If you look at the 3D image on the bottom, you can see this is a transesophageal, midesophageal view, and you can see a moderator band connecting to the anterior papillary muscle. Now, the tricuspid valve may have normal as well as aberrant cords. Uh, normal cords are attached at the edge, and accessory cord can also be seen attached to the septum, free will, and moderator band. Now, if you look at the image in the middle, you can have aberrant short cords that lead to severe tricuspid regurgitation. These cords are generally attached to the body of the leaflet and they displace the jet from the annular plane into the right ventricle. Now you can also have short non-aberrant cords attached to the edge of the leaflets. Now these cords also though can result in tethering and displacement of the jet from the annular plane into the right ventricle. The tricuspid valve annulus is actually D-shaped. Now it's a virtual structure similar to that of the aortic annulus. It's, um, the, it's, there's not a continuous fibrous ring around the tricuspid annulus. In some areas there's just fat and it's usually defined as the plane where the leaflets insert into um, the area where the right atrium and right ventricle or myocardium meet. The normal annular circumference is about 12 centimeters. The normal annular area is about 11 centimeters squared. Now, women tend to have bigger tricuspid valve annuli than men. 
Now one of the things that's very important to note is the location of the coronary sinus because it plays a very important role in terms of identification of the tricuspid leaflet structures. Now there are two ways that the tricuspid annulus has been broken down for identification purposes. The first is the surgical perspective which breaks it down into an aortic, anterior, posterior, and septal areas. The other is the agricola segmentation, which breaks it down into an anterior septal commissure area, an anterior leaflet area, an anterior posterior commissure area, a posterior leaflet area, as well as a posterior septal commissure area. Now, the tricuspid valve annulus is actually very dynamic and changes throughout the cardiac cycle. As you can see, the area changes greatly, as well as the perimeter, as well as the circularity during the cardiac cycle. Now, you can get a reduction of almost 20% in terms of dimensions and perimeter, as well as a 30% reduction in tricuspid annular area during systole. Now, the tricuspid valve is um, surrounded by other important cardiac structures. As you can see, it's adjacent to the aortic root. Um, this is why if you have an aortic root abscess, you also have to take a look at the tricuspid valve to see that there's uh, not been any spread to affect that valve. It's right next to the mitral valve, and once again, um, processes that affect the mitral or the tricuspid valve could affect the other uh, valve. Similarly, if anteriorly, it's got the pulmonic valves of the LV outflow tract. The tricuspid valve uh, is very close to the conduction system. Uh, this is why surgeries involving the tricuspid valve can lead to conduction system abnormalities. So if you look at the leftmost image, this is a cross-sectional um, cut plane through the crux of the heart. You can see the um, uh, interatrial septum, the septal insertion point of the mitral valve leaflet, the septal insertion of the tricuspid valve leaflet, and then the interventricular septum. There is a gap between the mitral valve insertion point and the tricuspid valve insertion uh, point, and this gap is the um, atrioventricular um, membranous septum. Okay, the if you take this cross-sectional image and you rotate it so you're looking at the insertion line of the tricuspid valve, you can see that the AV node sits in this atrioventricular uh, membranous septum. And then if you take a close-up of that node, you can see that um, it then connects down to the His bundle as well as the left and right um, uh, bundles. Now, when we look at the coronary, um, we can see that the right coronary actually surrounds uh, three quarters of the tricuspid valve annulus. So here we have a CT scan showing the tricuspid valve annulus with the right coronary artery um, and its path. And you can see that it's closer to the tricuspid uh, valve annulus towards the distal part of the coronary as opposed to the origin. Now, tricuspid valve re tricuspid regurgitation etiology. Most causes of tricuspid regurgitation are actually secondary or functional, um, and uh, a few are primary. Now, secondary causes include left heart disease, right ventricular dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension, as well as atrial fibrillation. Primary causes included congenital abnormalities or acquired diseases such as carcinoid, myxomatous valve disease, endocarditis, pacemaker leads, or RV biopsy damage. Now, how does tricuspid regurgitation develop? Well, regardless of whether or not you have primary or secondary tricuspid regurgitation, they all end up in this continue, this final pathway of RV volume overload that leads to more RV and RA dilatation, and then more tricuspid regurgitation. Now, how does tricuspid regurgitation develop? Well, as you get tricuspid uh, RA and RV dilatation, you get more tricuspid annular dilatation and remodeling. The, leaf, the annulus in tricuspid, um, patients with tricuspid regurgitation loses its uh, normal shape and becomes flattened. With tricuspid regurgitation, you also get remodeling of the leaflets and cords and papillary muscles um, become distorted because of the RV changes as well as the RA changes, and this causes the papillary muscles to move more laterally as well as medially, as well as get become apically displaced, changing the tricuspid valve coaptation. You then get um, tricuspid regurgitation, and which leads to more volume overload, and then that results in more distortion of the RA and RV. Um, dilatation and then the cycle continues. Now how do we identify tricuspid valve anatomy? So traditionally we actually uh, thought that in the RV inflow view as you see on the left image um, that was the anterior and posterior leaflet. 
And then in the short axis view, um, with the RV inflow and outflow, you've got the septal and anterior leaflet. In a four chamber view, you're looking at a septal and anterior leaflet, and then a transgastric, you're looking at septal and posterior leaflets. However, we know that on 2D imaging, we can be wrong about how we're identifying the tricuspid valve anatomy. So this is a 3D data set, and, you, uh, and it's been cut to show a four chamber view. However, on the top four chamber view, you're actually cutting through the septal and posterior leaflets, whereas on the bottom four chamber view, you're actually cutting through the anterior and septal leaflets. But both views, it'd be very difficult to identify which leaflet is which. So you actually have to look at the uh, structure surrounding tricuspid valve leaflets to make sure you're identifying it correctly. So this, I'm showing these pictures, even though they're transthoracic, because it clearly demonstrates how to identify the leaflets. And so then we'll I'll go through the transesophageal imaging next after I cover through this. So if you're in a short axis view of the, if you look at the leftmost panel and you look, and we're at the short axis view showing the inflow outflow view, if you see the tricuspid valve leaflets and you see a single leaflet in this view, then you are cutting through the anterior leaflet. If you tilt a little bit so you're once again still in this short axis inflow outflow view and you see two leaflets, you're cutting through the anterior and posterior leaflets. If you see three leaflets in the short axis view and you see an LVOT, then you're actually going through the septal, the anterior, and the posterior leaflets. Now, in an RV inflow view, where you've tilted and you've got um, the two leaflets you can see. If you see a coronary sinus there, then you are looking at septal as well as the anterior leaflet. If you actually have closed off so you don't see the coronary sinus, then you're looking at the posterior leaflet and the anterior leaflet. Now, when you are in a four chamber view, it's very hard if you don't have any structures to know where you're looking at. It could be the septal and anterior or septal and posterior leaflets. However, if you're tilted anteriorly and you see the um, aortic root or LV outflow tract, then you know that you're cutting through the septal and anterior leaflet. If you've tilted back and you see the coronary sinus, you know you're cutting through the, um, uh, the septal and posterior leaflets. Now, let's move on to transesophageal imaging. So, in a mid-esophageal view, sometimes you, if you can't see your tricuspid valve leaflet, you'll have to actually push down and be in a low esophageal view. But in a mid-esophageal view, you're usually looking at the septal and anterior leaflet. If you push down and you see the coronary sinus, then you're looking at the posterior and anterior leaflets. Okay. Now, if you're in a short axis view, and you just see two leaflets, you're usually looking at anterior and posterior leaflets. If you push down and you foreshorten your view and you're not seeing in your lowest esophageal, then you're looking at septal and anterior leaflet. Okay. Now, when you're in the transgastric view, the transgastric view is actually the easiest to identify it. If you're in the transgastric view and you're in a short axis view, you can clearly identify the septum. If you see the liver, you know that that's the posterior leaflet, and then by default, the other one is the anterior leaflet. And then when you cut through with your cross planes and you get a long axis view, then you can actually know when you're cutting through what you're looking at, whether or not you're looking at the anterior posterior leaflet or the anterior septal leaflet. Now, sometimes if you're doing a deep transgastric view, you can see, if you see three leaflets and you cut through, then you are looking at the anterior and posterior leaflets. Um, and then on the, the three leaflets you're seeing are usually the septal, anterior, and posterior leaflets. Okay. So recently there's been a push to better refine how we identify the tricuspid leaflets beyond what we've been doing already. And part of this comes out of the work that's being done on percutaneous tricuspid valve uh, procedures. Uh, Becky Hahn and her group have made this proposal of six different uh, types of tricuspid valve leaflets. Uh, if you look here, They've got cartoons uh, summarizing each of the types, and this is a transesophageal short axis view of the tricuspid valve with the septal leaflet in yellow, the posterior leaflet in green, and the anterior leaflet in red. And type one is 
uh, the traditional uh, tri-leaflet valve with a septal anterior and posterior leaflet. The blue dot represents the anterior papillary muscle, and this is what they use to divide an anterior from a posterior leaflet. If you look at type 2, this is the typical two um, or uh, two leaflet tricuspid valve with a septal and then a, a fused anterior and posterior leaflet. Type 3A has five leaflets with a septal, posterior, and then the anterior divided by a cleft into an A1 and A2 region. Type 2, 3B is five leaflets, but here the um, posterior leaflet is divided into two by a P1 and P2. A type 3C is where the uh, septal leaflet is actually divided into two, so you have an anterior posterior as well as an S1 and an S2. And then type 4 is a five leaflet tricuspid valve with a septal, a P1, P2, as well as an A1 and A2. Now, they found in their study of consecutive patients undergoing tricuspid valve assessment, the majority of patients have this type 1 or the traditional tri leaflet tricuspid valve that we're, we know of. However, the 30% of patients have a type 2B, which is where the posterior leaflet is divided by cleft into P1 and P2. Now, one of the things as you look at these studies is you realize that uh, 3D echocardiography is very uh, useful for looking at and identifying all three leaflets simultaneously. So if you are doing 2D transthoracic imaging, only about 5 to 10% of the time will you be able to see all three leaflets in a single image. With transesophageal imaging, about 65 to 70% of the time. And that's simply because of the anterior location of the tricuspid valve in the chest, making it very far from the probe and making it challenging to obtain that image. Transthoracic imaging is, uh, 3D imaging is very ideal for it because of the location. And so about 85 to 90% of the time with uh, transthoracic 3D imaging, you'll identify all three leaflets in the single view. Uh, beyond identifying leaflet morphology, you can actually identify the pathology of, with uh, 3D echocardiography. So here, uh, going from left to right, there's an example of a dysplastic valve with the abnormal cordi, uh, patient with both mitral as well as tricuspid carcinoid syndrome, and you can see the thickened restricted leaflet of the uh, tricuspid valve. A patient with functional tricuspid regurgitation, the leaflets are highly mobile, but they just do not have a uh, coapt in the center because of the dilatation of the RV, and then a patient with pulmonary hypertension. Um, one of the most valuable uh, uh, uses of 3D echocardiography has been the identification of the role of pacemakers in the development of tricuspid regurgitation. So if you look at the image on the left, we're sitting in the right ventricle looking up at the valve, and you can see that the pacemaker lead is going between the septal and the posterior leaflets. And it's in the commissure there, so it's not a, uh, affecting coaptation. You can see that the leaflets come together and there's no gap seen during systole. Now, if you look at the image on the right, you can see that the, the pacemaker lead is impinging on the septal leaflet. And so during systole, there's a gap between the anterior posterior leaflet as well as the septal leaflet because the septal leaflet is unable to move forward to co op with the normal um, anterior and posterior leaflets. Now, 3D has also improved our understanding of how much we underestimate tricuspid annular measurements. Um, from a four-chamber view. Uh, typically, uh, these are done in the OR to decide whether or not the tricuspid valve should be repaired at the time of mitral uh, valve surgery, regardless of the amount of tricuspid regurgitation present. Here you can see it's a four-chamber view, and on the 3D cut plane that matches that four-chamber view, you can see that we're actually not cutting at the longest dimension of the tricuspid annulus, and so we're underestimating how big it actually is. Now, in terms of tri tricuspid valve um, acquisition, similar to the mitral valve, what you want to do is you want to find an imaging plane where you see the tricuspid valve leaflets very well in both systole and diastole, and you also want to make sure it's as perpendicular as you can get through to the beam. And then when you acquire your tricuspid valve, most of the times because it is slightly off axis, you will have to use some cropping to uh, show and display the valve nicely. So here we have a patient who has uh, myxomas uh, tricuspid valve disease disease, and uh, we have acquired it in this um, uh, mid-esophageal inflow-outflow view, and you can, and then we've cropped it to, re, uh, to align it so we're looking on fast at the tricuspid valve leaflets, and you can see both the prolapse and the leaflets as well as the jet that's coming through there. So in summary, the tricuspid valve 
uh, is mainly imaged using echocardiography, while transthoracic is um, probably slightly better than transesophageal. It is, um, transesophageal is the main modality used, especially for interventions. Landmarks surrounding the trichosis valve anatomy are very important to ensure, ensure accurate leaflet identification, and even now, we're now moving towards where we're sub-identifying the leaflets. And uh, 3D echocardiography vastly improves how we assess uh, the leaflets. Uh, thank you for listening.